Us nurses, we're teachers, even if we don't consider ourselves as such. And let's think about this situation, even though we're not literally sitting down one on one with our patients for a quote unquote education session. We are constantly updating them all throughout their visit, all throughout their hospital stay about their treatments, their side effects. I mean, the list is literally endless. We want it to be as simple as possible. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Actually ask them the question, how would you explain your treatment or your diagnosis to a friend or a family member? And it can be even just as simple as explaining why your white blood cell count is low or what a white blood cell count does. So therefore having the patient explain back to you what was taught to them will allow the nurses to gauge what the patient has understood and absorbed, right? You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS, and today we are joined by ONS member Amanda Serafin, Nurse Manager at Mount Sinai Health System in New York City, to discuss how oncology nurses and patients can find reputable education resources during all stages of care. You can also earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks for joining me today, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, our cancer patients have so much to process when they're given a diagnosis and so many new terms and medications, and then to have to try and understand our medical jargon. So let's discuss why patient education is such an important component of care with people with cancer. I mean, Stephanie, this is such a great podcast to be a part of because we really cannot emphasize the importance of patient education enough. Us nurses, we're teachers, even if we don't consider ourselves as such. And let's think about this situation, even though we're not literally sitting down one-on-one with our patients for a quote-unquote education session to teach them about their side effects or their chemo. We are constantly updating them all throughout their visit, all throughout their hospital stay, updating them about their treatments, their side effects. I mean, the list is literally endless. And this is so important because not only are the patients learning throughout their treatment on what to expect, It is really up to us nurses to continue with that education and keep them informed throughout, even if it's something that we've already repeated and informed them. And that's why I personally feel that I'm very passionate about education because of its utmost importance and because, well, let's face it, we really do not know everything. And if there's something that we don't know, and the information wasn't given to us, it may be some very valuable information that we've missed and we wouldn't have known any of the side effects or what to expect with our treatment. Those are such good points. And honestly, how many times have we all, everybody who's listening, taken care of patients who have come in with either printed information from the internet or stories from well-meaning friends and family And they are bringing all that to us, asking us questions about their treatment or what might be happening to them. So, you know, education resources are available everywhere, print, online, through apps on our phones. So as nurses, how can we evaluate whether the education is accurate, current, and coming from a credible source? I mean, Stephanie, information is literally at our fingertips, right? We go to our computers, we type in the search bar, whatever information we want to learn about, whether it's us as nurses wanting to understand a disease process more clearly, whether we're looking at patient education, 
or any other information, we literally type whatever and voila, it's there. So it's a wealth of information and it can be extremely overwhelming for that matter. And I believe like healthcare institutions usually are good about informing their staff on what reputable websites should be used when obtaining patient education. But if you get yourself into a bind, a golden rule typically is that any health websites sponsored by federal government agencies are typically a good source of information. Large professional organizations and well-known medical schools are also a good source of patient education. So in a nutshell, when you're searching, you want websites that end in .gov, .edu, or .org, just to give a very brief amount of examples. Now, you mentioned you know, working with your staff to make sure that, you know, they're learning and looking at those types of sources. Would you say that you would be giving that same information to your patients to help them determine if the information that they're reading is reliable and accurate as well? Absolutely. I would definitely want to be directing them into the correct area when they are looking for their information. We all know when we're given information, we get extremely overwhelmed and we go to quote unquote Dr. Google and we start looking things up and we might get caught up in different websites or different social media platforms. But like I said, a good golden rule to go by is that we really want to stick to those large professional organizations and well-known medical schools for patient or nursing education. Okay, thank you. I think those are some really good tips to remember. And those are easy things to remember when you're, especially when you're looking on the internet with the .gov, .edu, or .org, and looking at those types of websites for that education. We want it to be as simple as possible. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) With as much information as they get, I'm sure they feel like every time they either go to an appointment or to a a treatment or a test that they're just, you know, given more and more and more information that is, like we said earlier, just overwhelming for them. And the diagnosis alone can be so overwhelming. So then adding in all of these other things and trying to make this as easy as possible for them because there is so much that they have to know and they have to recognize for side effects management and reporting of those types of things. So it is so important. So as nurses and patients are looking for information, how might they report inaccurate information that they find about cancer care, whether it's online or from another format? I'm going to have to be honest, personally, just thinking off the top of my head, I haven't been involved in any situation that I've needed to report false information, but we would be able to stop the spread of inaccurate information if we simply reported it. So typically sites have a contact us option located at the bottom of their website. So that would be my first suggestion to be able to report that information. So Amanda, how can nurses address concerns that patients have that when they find inaccurate information? It's simply that the nurses and other parts of the healthcare team, we have to kind of redirect the patient and have them unlearn the inaccurate information that they've read. It's important for us to obviously understand the methods that our patients learn the best and educate them in that way. Let the patient explain to you what inaccurate information they've gathered online and redirect them to a reputable source, whether it's another website, a video, a handout, or even better, spending a little extra one-on-one time with the patient to explain the correct information to them. Then that gives us the ability to perform teach back and the patient can reiterate to us what we've taught them. The moral of the story is that we want to know what information the patient understands. Again, we can provide hours of patient education, which can be extremely overwhelming. But if the patient isn't absorbing it because of various obvious reasons, right, they're overwhelmed to begin with, then the information becomes lost. So one good, 
good practice that I have spoke to my staff about and like to carry on to others when educating our patients is to actually ask them the question, how would you explain your treatment or your diagnosis to a friend or a family member? And it can be even just as simple as explaining why your white blood cell count is low or what a white blood cell count does. So therefore, having the patient explain back to you what was taught to them will allow the nurses to gauge what the patient has understood and absorbed, right? So that's a good kind of tip to take with you. That is a really good tip to remember when we are trying to teach our patients because you're right, we could be talking and talking and talking and giving them all the information that we have and that we know they need, but there may be a very strong disconnect between what we're saying and what they're understanding, but asking them to explain it back to you and putting it in a way that I know that you're going to have all of your family members asking you numerous times, you know, what is going on? How are you doing? What are you getting? What what medicine are you getting? Because maybe I got that one, you know, those kinds of things and having them explain it back to you will definitely help us as, you know, the educators and folks with the information know that they understood what we were telling them. So that's a really, really good way to evaluate you know, what they have retained and our understanding. And I think it's so important also that we give them the feeling that they can be comfortable telling us what they understand or what they don't understand or, you know, information that they're finding and they, they're not sure if it's right or not. And, you know, just not that we would be upset with them by any means, but that they would be nervous to tell us, you know, information, what, again, you know, going to like that symptom management and, you know, what are you experiencing and just kind of reiterating to them that every person is different in how they respond to treatment. And it's so important for you to let us know what is happening to you, because what might have happened to a friend or family member that they're telling you their whole story may not happen to you. And if something different happens, don't feel like, oh, well, that wasn't what Aunt Sally experienced. So maybe this is wrong. And I, you know, I don't know. So it's really important to let them know that it's okay to tell us and like you said, this teach back is a really good way to say, this is what we want you to know. But if someone else tells you something, that doesn't mean that it's wrong or what you're experiencing is wrong, but make sure that you come back and let us know. Exactly. And I always go back to the saying that oncology nursing is an extremely rewarding career. And a lot of the times the patient's treat us as if we were their family. And a lot of times they tell us information that they wouldn't even want to tell their family if they're experiencing a certain side effect or what have you. So yes, Stephanie, I definitely agree that we as oncology nurses have to have that type of relationship with our patients, that they'd be willing to tell us anything that's going on with them as far as their treatment is concerned. So another area of concern for patients is the cost of care. I just think that, you know, with the media and everything else that pours into patients and things that they hear, it's just so, again, overwhelming. So are there credible resources out there that patients and families can understand what the cost of treatment is and learn about financial assistance? Of course. One of my many go-tos, which is the National Cancer Institute, actually has a wealth of information for patients as they navigate through the scary journey for them. I also feel like institutions typically have something or someone called a financial counselor or a financial navigator that can assist patients and their families to understand the financial aspects of their cancer treatment. For those of you unfamiliar with the role of a financial counselor, it's a very important role. 
It's someone who works with patients to help them reduce the stress or hardship related to the cost of their treatment for cancer. They also help patients understand their out-of-pocket expenses, what their health insurance plans may cover, help patients set up payment plans, find cost-saving methods, and improve access to healthcare services that the patient might need throughout their journey. I think in some settings, too, if they don't have a financial counselor, sometimes social workers can work in that and can kind of help in those ways as well. Absolutely. So that was one thing that patients deal with is the cost of care. The next is immediately, you know, the immediate thing that comes to mind is their actual diagnosis. And what does that mean? So what are some resources for educating patients on the diagnosis and what survivorship might look like in that diagnosis? Personally, I feel that the American Cancer Society and Cancer.gov have some really great resources for patients and their caregivers, not only on their diagnosis, but the treatment, side effects, support groups, anything that they are, you know, they have access to throughout their treatment. And the good thing about these sites is that they have videos, various pictures to explain what um, the topic is that they're trying to target and other reputable resources, which may be useful depending on the patient's needs. And, and the sites actually will include links to different support groups and things like that. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop, so to say. I'm sure that's helpful to them to just have, like you said, that one-stop shop so that they can just go there and kind of see the whole diagnosis trajectory almost and what that might look like for them. Exactly. So then the next piece of diagnosis for patients would be understanding their treatment options. You know, they might have to have surgery or radiation or something, you know, they might just be getting targeted therapies or immunotherapy. So what resources are available for treatment? Again, I think that going back to the American Cancer Society or cancer.gov, I personally, again, really like utilizing their videos. And the fact that these sites target all the learning needs of our patients. And the other important aspect of these sites is that these sites use plain language, which is how we should be educating our patients and how that information should be delivered. Because, you know, like we keep saying that this is a lot. This is a lot for them to go through. Their mind is going a mile a minute. And we the last thing we want them to be is overwhelmed. So we want to try and give them as much resources as we can, but we want them to be reputable resources and resources that they know how to access and that they understand. Yeah, again, that understanding piece is so important and directing them to somewhere that will give them reputable and correct information is just so, so very important. Absolutely. So now what resources are available to educate patients on chemotherapy administration? You know, almost every patient is probably going to get some type of chemotherapy. So whether that's oral or IV, where would you recommend that they go for that information? For patients, I would say, again, same thing, the American Cancer Society, cancer.gov, You know, there are so many different avenues that they can utilize on those sites. And it's broken down by, you know, cancer type. And it goes through from soup to nuts. If you're to have surgery, this is what to expect. If you are, you know, diagnosed with this type of cancer, this is what to expect. Whether, again, it's surgery, whether it's radiation, whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's uh, targeted therapy. I mean, for nurses, ONS has a wealth of books, ebooks, podcasts, articles. NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, is an extremely valuable resource for nurses. And this site provides information on specific protocol cycles. And again, it can be filtered per your specific, you know, cancer uh, type. So. Those are all really good sites to utilize both for patients and for nurses. Okay. So some chemotherapy education resources for patients and providers I know of you mentioned 
are the oral chemotherapy education sheets, which you had a hand in um, working with ONS in creating. Can you tell us more about these resources? These resources are phenomenal. I love, love, love these cards. Uh, Being a part of this volunteer assignment, quite honestly, I really enjoyed it. Mostly because of my, you know, love for education, my background, my experience, and truthfully just wanting to be a part of a committee that their vision was to create a good, valuable resource for patients, you know, not only patients, nurses, and the entire health team. These IV uh, and oral cards are a great guide for, you know, consistent education for our patients. There's no stone unturned with these. I mean, they are so thorough and they hit all of the educational points that are needed for our patients. You know, they are a little lengthy, but everything is included in these cards that is, you know, reliable information for our patients coming from the name of the regimen, uses, their treatment schedule, other medications that they might start to hear about possible side effects that they will or might experience. And again, we're touching on side effects that are the most common. I mean, if we really were going to create these cards, they would have been 25 pages long, right? We know that there are a lot of side effects that patients can experience from chemotherapy. However, it doesn't mean that they're going to have all those side effects. So we really wanted to touch on the most common side effects, how to manage these side effects. And it's all in bulleted form. It's very easy to read. And lastly, it touches on two very important points that sometimes are left out with patient education is how to handle body fluids and waste at home and intimacy, sexual activity, and contraception. There's also links that we can provide our patients on where we were able to get this information and if they wanted any additional information. So these cards are a great guide. Like I said, I can't uh, speak highly of them enough. So Amanda, do you actually give these cards to your patients or do nurses use them to guide what they're going to teach? These are available for patient education. You can absolutely give them to your patients. And there's free text options that you're able to write in specific instructions that are, you know, unique to your patient. But again, nurses can use this if you're a new nurse to oncology and you're learning about specific uh, disease sites or chemotherapy regimens. These are also a great resource. I will say we created medication cards at my institution that were extremely valuable to the nurses. And it was all of this information in a nutshell in a little laminated card that we had on a key ring. And every time there was a new regimen, a new card came out. And this is the same concept. It's just a really great resource. So you mentioned that you were on the team that worked on these resources. How did the team develop the resource and evaluate the evidence to support them? So the individuals, I believe, don't quote me, there was about eight to 10 of us. Uh, We were given an assignment to review and focus on assigned uh, regimens. And like I said before, major side effects and most importantly, the need to focus on the major teaching points that the patients need to understand when they're receiving their treatments. Um, The information with these chemo cards were obtained from our individual knowledge base um, and various other reputable resources that the team used for their patient education previously. We had the sole purpose in mind of these medication cards to give to our patients, you know, and have nurses uh, utilize these as well, you know, without becoming overwhelmed while reading it. And that's, like I said before, uh, what I love most about this resource is the consistency of it and the flow of the information. It is not too overwhelming, and it provides the specific information that the patient needs and provides area where the healthcare team can add notes specific to that patient as well. Are there plans or ways that you think these resources might need to be improved? I mean, like I said um, before, I think maybe they are a little lengthy. 
but again, I, I really can't say enough about them. I think that the information, you know, the, the reason why it can be five, six, seven pages long is because we're really trying to give the patient as much information as possible in a clean, well thought out format. Well, they are definitely some excellent resources that can be used, like you have said, and just the work that went into what you and the team did to develop those is amazing. And, you know, it is definitely something that, you know, you as the boots on the ground nurses working with the patients day in and day out and knowing the things that are important for our patients to know and being able to put those into as concise as possible with the amount of information that needs to go into it, these resource education sheets is is amazing. I think the take-home point is that education is so valuable and extremely useful, and it's really right at our fingertips. Personally, when I first started as an oncology nurse, chemo care was my go-to strictly because that was the only site that I was told to use. And don't get me wrong, ChemoCare is a phenomenal site. There are so many reliable, reputable resources on that site. But I think that institutions or, you know, societies for that matter, just need to continue to promote and broadcast the resources that are available out there to nurses. And, you know, the word will get out. We can simply share these resources at meetings. We have patient education committees, or you can just make it plain and simple and you can mention it in morning huddle and show the staff how to access them so they can understand where to get them. And then they can show their patients how to get them as well. So what other resources does ONS have that you would recommend for educating patients who have a diagnosis of cancer with? I mean, ONS is I I can't speak enough on, you know, the resources that are there for, you know, nurses to be able to give to their patients as long as they know how to access them. Like we spoke before, the, the oral chemo cards are great. The IV chemo cards are great. There might be a video link that they can send their patients. There might be an ebook that's available on, you know, survivorship or what have you. You know, there, there really is a lot of information out there. I think, like I said, I think we just need to broadcast the resources, you know, so people know where to get them. You have mentioned, you know, all the resources that nurses can use as well, you know, with the online books or, you know, different things like that. Was there anything else that you could think of that you would recommend maybe to new nurses that are coming into oncology you know, for them to learn more about? The chemo basics is probably my Bible, the chemo biotherapy book that you have access to when you, you know, sign up for your biotherapy course is another phenomenal resource. But, you know, new coming into oncology, we need to start at safe handling basics, um, understanding the basics and like I said, there's there's a wealth of information and, you know, we don't want to overwhelm new nurses either, but we also want to encourage new nurses to come into the uh, field of oncology. So I think just starting out with those basics um, would be extremely helpful for them and utilizing these cards, because like I said, the information is all in there that they can really start to build their foundation with. Well, I want to thank you for your passion for education. It comes through loud and clear in in how much this means to you and what you do for your patients. And just even in your involvement in the chemotherapy education sheets, you know, that's so important. So I like to end our podcast with a couple of questions each time, just quick fire. And I will have those for you. So I want to ask that. First of all, what are some common misconceptions about accessing patient education resources, whether online or from a healthcare professional? I mean, I think the saying really fits here that some believe that delivering too much education is just too much and it's too overwhelming for our patients. But in reality, we really cannot 
enforce patient education enough. And the constant reminders and just following up ensures the patient understands. And that is really priceless. I think that the lack of knowledge of reliable, reputable resources is important to consider. And as nurses, we really need to encourage patients that when they research their treatment or their diagnosis, that we have to have that conversation that I feel like always comes up. And some of us are even guilty of it that you know, Mrs. Smith, I know you're going to go home and you're going to go on Google and that's fine, but you'll most likely be overwhelmed with information. Some of it may be reliable and some may not. And I think that we can all speak to that. We just get caught up. And as patient advocates, if we guide them to the correct resources, those resources will give them the facts and help guide them through their treatment and may even trigger some questions for them to write down and ask at their next next treatment or when they follow up with their oncologist. And that's, you know, very helpful to kind of have that diary that they keep. Okay. And my other one is what is something about online patient education resources that are not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? I think that it just helps to know that there are a multitude of resources out there for us. Um, Again, promoting these resources and ensuring that people know how to access these resources is extremely important and valuable. Like I said before, as a new nurse, I was like, okay, chemo care is my go-to. I relied on that site so much. But once I was exposed to videos through, you know, cancer.gov or American Cancer Society or Medscape or wherever else, it was helpful to me because then I had a better understanding of what I needed to educate my patients on And I was able to explain it in ways that they would be able to understand it. And that's what I really wanted to be able to do for them. Amanda, again, I just want to thank you for being with me today and having this conversation. I think it's one that is so very important, you know, like you have said, and again, your passion for patient education and just how important it is that we as nurses understand where to find the reliable, credible, evidence-based education for our patients and how important it is to give to them. Do you have any final comments for us today? I mean, in a nutshell, if anyone's going to take anything home, I think it's just a very important topic for us nurses. And I feel like this isn't discussed enough. I mean, patient education does not stop, right? We constantly have to enforce and reinforce and find those reputable resources to assist us with that. But, you know, it's truly been a pleasure to share my passion. And I hope that I've answered all of the questions to guide others with their patient education and those resources to them. Again, I'll go back to those chemo sheets and they truly are great resources for nurses, you know, not only nurses, but also patients. And they really assist in guiding patients to understand their treatment, the ins and outs of their treatment. So I really encourage you if you have not been exposed to them to really check them out. But regardless, I would like to end on one note. I know it's been some trying times for us all, but regardless of our role, I would like you all to know how appreciated you are and thank you for all you do day in and day out. Oncology is such a rewarding career, so always remember that. Thank you again. Thanks, Amanda, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.